All right, strength programming. I was psyched as able to offer my insight on this topic, specifically how I like to break down each of the movements we cover, including regressions, progressions, accessory work, and anything else John Lindsay felt like asking me. Episode four, let's go. Actually, we'll be interviewing as a team. You are the best movers on the planet. So bro, what kind of muscles you have? No. Bro, what kind of patterns you have? We're here to fuck shit up. All right. All right, so we're diving into a strength-focused topic on the Movement Athlete Podcast. I'm John Lindsay. My guest today is our other co-host. Dr. Wes Hendricks. We're at it again. So because, as most of you all know, I'm sure a lot of you all follow us both on social media, I definitely tend to side towards the mobility aspects of training, and Wes is definitely more strength-focused. I'd say he's uh, I'd say he definitely is more experienced in that field. Um, so I'm going to go over. I'm going to kind of lead a conversation today on strength based training. It's going to be very body weight focused, but I'm sure we'll touch on some barbell focused things, especially when it comes to the lower body, maybe supplemental exercises for upper body strength things as well. So um, to start it off, let's just uh, let's just go over to Wes and Wes. What are your current what are the goals that your current uh, that your current programming is focused towards? What are those goals for myself or just anyone in general? For you, for me, you know, it basically centers around vertical and a vertical, yeah, vertical pushing and pulling. So primarily, you know, one arm chin up being the pulling, handstand push up being the pushing, and then you know, a secondary goal kind of like what we talked about in the mobility episode, you focus more on middle splits and you know you're going to get some pancake benefits from it. I focus mainly on handstand push-up and one-arm chin-up, but that also lends itself to some horizontal pulling and pushing, being the planche or planche or lever or lever, depending on what country you're on. So they build off of each other, and I choose to spend my time more on the handstand push-up and one-arm chin-up, but I've seen some nice carryover. Why? So... I've heard that a lot, and I think I can, because uh, I train, I'm not nearly as experienced or as far along in the journey as you are, but I can definitely see where those carry over. Could you explain how, like, the one-arm chin and a lever, like what you just said, the one-arm chin, the lever, the handstand push-up and the plunge, how do they translate? Like, what is the what is the reasoning that they do translate? So kind of my hypothesis on this right now is, you know, the handstand push-up, it's a dynamic movement. So we're moving through this full range of motion. But even though we're moving through this full range of motion um, for a good handstand pushup, we need to maintain a nice level of scapula protraction um, while bending the elbows. So scapula protraction, think about like pushing away or rounding the upper back, basically what you need to maintain that planche position. So I'm training it in this dynamic fashion in a handstand pushup. Um, and I'm also training accessory work to strengthen that protraction, you know, maybe scapula push-ups, maybe some planche work, um, but training it dynamically where I'm moving through a range of motion just seems to lend itself to then if I want to do an isometric movement like a planche where I'm holding it, um, it seems to carry over nicely from dynamic to isometric, but not so much from isometric to dynamic, just in my experience. Cool. Same thing goes with the one arm chin up lever i'd give you the same reasoning or explanation there nice gotcha so let's take let's dive let's start from the beginning we've got a newbie who's like i'm very interested in this more body weight style of training um maybe they're coming from a general fitness background like very structured around the bro style bench press bicep curls that sort of thing and they want to dive into their goals are what you just laid out their goals are a for pulling, they want to eventually get to a one arm chin. For pushing, they would love to get a freestanding handstand push up. Um, what does that baseline look like? If there is a baseline, uh, what, what does that look like? So the for the planche, lever, one arm chin up, you know, we can, I don't want to say more or less just start getting after it, but there's not this other component. The handstand push up has this other component being the handstand. You may have all the strength in the world to execute the handstand push-up, but if you don't have a handstand, you're kind of shit out of luck. So you're kind of juggling two separate things, 
Um, so I guess I'll start with the planche lever and one arm chin up. Can I actually add, can I add one piece? So what, yeah. what would actually be, so you were talking planche, one arm chin, yeah. what would be an assessment you would actually give someone? Like what would be, Ooh, okay. what would be something to establish a baseline for the person I described? Yeah. So most people, when they reach out to me, I don't think I've ever had someone that's just like, dude, I'm benching, I'm doing curls. I want a one arm chin up. It just doesn't like the progression doesn't work that way. People come in being like, Hey, I've tried to do some planche work. You know, I've tried to work on my handstand or like I, I've tried to start dabbling in one arm chin up work. And most of the time they've either not had success, um, you know, at the best they haven't had a success or at worst, you know, they've ended up injuring themselves by doing too much volume to try to achieve this goal. So, you know, they already have an understanding or they have some, some level of exposure of these movements. So I want to get a, get a general idea of where they're at. But when I assess them, I don't want a general idea of what their max capacity is. You know, like, because the the longer I've been doing this, the more advanced athletes I get. You know, and I'll have people be like, hey, I have a full range of motion handstand push-up on the P-bars. But that's if, you know, the stars align, they've tapered down for three days, and they fasted for a week. You know, I want to know what what they can train on a regular basis. I don't care what your your glory rep is when, when the stars are aligned. I want to know what you are capable of 80% of the time. So we can train that because that's what I need you doing on a regular basis. So, you know, maybe if you're working towards a planche, but you can barely planche, I want to know what your 10 second banded tuck planche looks like. You know, I want to know what ideally if you have, like if you can do an arching hang or a tuck lever and a goal of yours as a, as a, as a front lever, I need to see some level of those. But if you don't have those, I'll start with the base level of just chin ups. Can you do a chin up? Um, Cause if not, we've got some work to do there. Uh, so I'll start with trying to reverse engineer or break down the movement and give me an idea of what your 80% capacity is. So I know what we can actually train. Cool. Um, so let's say you've got a guy who's, they've got chin ups, chest to bar too. So they're yeah. able to, at the top, they're fully retracting scapula. They're definitely there. Uh, handstand pushups, maybe they can execute. Uh, what would be an what would be an entry level drill for the handstand pushup? I'm picturing a pipe pushup. Yeah, so honestly, we can start even if you don't have a handstand, you can start strength training the strength for the handstand pushup at any time. It's just a matter of will you have the balance component to execute. Um, so you can train like you can start off day one if you don't have a handstand at all, training for the handstand pushup and the handstand simultaneously. Just a matter of you know assuming you're recovering, you're not taking on too many things too soon but they can be working hand in hand, if that makes sense. Um, so a base level drill, you know, maybe a, a pipe handstand pushup like you talked about. Um, it may just be, it may just be a scapula pushup because we're still strengthening that scapula protraction. Um, so it really just depends on where they're at. Um, but yeah, probably the, to give the answer, pipe handstand pushup would be the entry level because for the most part, you can regress that movement down um, pretty basic where your feet and hands are on the floor. So yes, I'd go with pike the handstand pushup. So how do you, uh, and that, and the handstand pushup is something that I completely struggle with that I totally struggle with, uh, honestly, the body awareness to know whether I'm maintaining scapula protract, scapula protraction during the entire movement. Is there, is there a drill you do? Let's say, They've got a couple good reps of a pipe handstand pushup. How do you regress from there? And how do you how do you coach also on top of that? How do you coach scapula retraction? Oh, I like the two part question there. Uh, so honestly, for you, for example, you have the handstand pushup, but now it's just a matter of peeling back the layers and making it. We could say prettier. Let's say. Yeah. Um, you know. That's what I want. I want the aesthetically pleasing. Yeah. Nice line. Because <laughs> it's fun, you know, yeah. you enjoy the process of doing it. I think it displays a better level of body awareness and strength, too. So I, uh, I, I don't disagree, and maybe I'm just biased to that. No, uh, it's absolutely true. But, um, you know, let's say we've got that pipe handstand push-up. Where do we go from there? Um, eventually, the goal is to get someone to chest-to-wall handstand push-ups. Because if you can do a chest-to-wall handstand push-up, and there's standards that need to be maintained and we'll definitely have to do some sort of long form post or video to build upon this. Cause it's hard to see in a, or it's hard to see on a podcast, 
But if you can do it to the correct standards, chest to wall, even a single rep, you should have the strength, not the balance, the strength to complete a freestanding handstand pushup. Um, because there's there's a uh, there's a pretty close correlation between the two. You're not going to see someone typically that can do 10 chest to wall handstand pushups and can't do a single freestanding handstand pushup. Like for example, I think I can do you know seven chest to wall handstand pushups and I can consistently knock out five freestanding handstand pushups. So there's there's a pretty good correlation. I've seen this for the most part across the board with all the athletes I've worked with. And I've progressed to handstand, freestanding handstand pushups as well. So it's a very good marker. So if you're doing correct chest to wall handstand pushups, you have the strength. Now it's just a matter of incorporating the skill of the handstand and the intricacies of the, the lean and all that, which is a whole nother topic. But the goal is always to get people doing chest to wall handstand pushups. And at a certain point, if you have piked handstand pushups, a great place to start is chest to wall eccentric handstand pushups. Uh, then to answer your second question on the scapula protraction. So, yeah, let's say we're, well, actually, sorry, I want to say over you, but yeah. what is, if we're working eccentrics and we're trying to think about this scapula protraction, would you do eccentrics from a pike position or would you? So you could definitely work eccentrics from a pike handstand position. It really just all depends on the, their, once again, what their 80% capacity, like what can I train 80% of the time? So it's a matter of finding out what that is. So if somebody isn't capable of, you know, pike handstand pushups, maybe I'd give them pike eccentric handstand pushups um, because that's just what they have available to themselves. Um, I'd just as easily maybe even choose a pike handstand pushup where they're doing it under a pull-up bar and they have a band attached to their waist so they can actually rep out, you know, eight, 10 reps because, you know, body weight exercises especially – we're generally working, you know, with the more advanced stuff. I don't want to say the more advanced stuff because whatever variation you're working at is more advanced for you. But it's very hard. Like, we get stuck in this one to three rep range, which is, you know, most of my time is for my goals is spent in that range. But I don't train in that range. I try to train in the eight to ten rep range uh, because it just creates larger capacity. It reduces my risk of injury. And it transfers nicely to the one to three rep range when I advance the movement. Um, so that's generally uh, what I'm looking for. I'm trying to find something where we can train in the eight to 10 rep range. So that's why maybe instead of doing an eccentric pike, I'd maybe do a banded pike handstand pushup. Cool. I like that. Um, and I've worked those drills and it's definitely helped me. Uh, so let's jump over to the one arm shin. Um, yeah. Let's say some guy or, or gal has uh, two to three reps, maybe four or five of really good chest of our shins. What are you thinking from there? Like what's the progression from there? So we got to expose them in my opinion to mixed grip chin ups. That's like okay. the, do you, sorry. Can I yeah. So your mixed grip chins, you're definitely thinking rings. Yeah. Well, do you see any difference between folks training on the bar versus training on the rings for just, traditional chins on both is there any do you see a, a strength difference between the two so that's a good question i most of my time is spent in the rings and it's just honestly because when you and i first started we were um, interested from ito's work and ito mainly spends a lot of time on the rings so when i saw one arm chin up i saw it done on the ring so that's kind of what i wanted to do um outside of that I've seen just as many um, kind of like, you know, if you get a one arm chin up on the rings, you can do a one arm chin up eccentric on the rings, um, you know, a one arm chin up isometric hold at the top on the rings. If you can do it on the rings, most of the time you should just be able to do it on the pull up bar. Or if not, maybe it takes, you know, a few weeks to get accustomed to the contours of the pull up bar versus the rings. But for the most part, um, they, they kind of transfer back and forth pretty well. Once again, you have that said principle with specific adaptation to impose demand. So whatever you want to get better at, you have to do. Um, so to a certain extent, if you really want to get good at bar one-arm chin-up stuff, you have to do bar one-arm chin-up stuff. Same goes for the rings. But for the most part, 
kind of like um, I think I might have talked about it on the inter when you interviewed me. I said when I did all that work on handstand pushups on my hands, and then went to the P bars, there was this drastic change. It's not the same with the rings and the the bar for the one arm chin up. They seem to, for the most part, have decent carryover, which is nice to know that you can spend your time on one and not then lose all the progress on the other. Yeah, that is nice. Okay, so we've got this person there, pretty good at chins on the bar or the rings, chest to bar, three to five reps, and they're like, okay, I'm feeling confident. They want to progress to that next movement. How do they start experimenting with the one-arm chin? Like, what, is a, what does a program look like there? Yeah, so the first thing I do is what I was calling is mixed grip chin-ups. So mixed grip chin-ups, you can do it on the rings, you can do it on the bar, it really doesn't matter. And this is kind of my introduction or my entry into the one-arm chin-up work. And you can you can make it as difficult or as easy as you want. So honestly, you could honestly take the mixed grip chin-up and just train that all the way to the one-arm chin-up. And I'm sure people have done it, depending on how well you respond to one-arm work. You may not need anything specific outside that, but the mixed grip chin up just being, you know, if we're, we're passively hanging on the gymnastics rings, that would be if I want to perform a, a one arm chin up or I'm isolating the left arm, I would shift my weight to the left arm as much as I want, still holding onto the ring with my right arm. And I'd pull myself up, ideally pulling my chin to the top of the strap of the left-sided ring, um, which would be like a full mixed grip chin. But if somebody can't isolate the left side or whatever side they're working on to that extreme, you could simply pull yourself to the center of the rings. Um, and it would just be the, the beginning of starting to slowly isolate that arm because it's a very long, it's a very tedious process, if I'm gonna be honest, depending on when where you're coming in at. Um, and you really gotta take your time with it. So some variation of pulling one, one arm supinated and then your other hand is more or less staying pronated uh, to support yourself. Nice, I like that. So what, from a programming standpoint, obviously we've talked about one arm chin, we've talked about the handstand pushup. Let's talk about legs too. So we've got obviously an upper body pull, an upper body push. What do you like to center around like a leg oriented thing? What are, is there a, is there a goal like that for lower body? Is there a, some sort of standard? Like what is your, when you're thinking lower body goals, progress for a client and, and, or yourself, like what are you thinking? So I guess at first, and really with all these things, you know, and you and I both get this question a lot, <laughs> like, what should I be working on? What do I want to do? Like, kind of like there's a, like there's a, like we followed some program and people are like, how, what was that program you followed to get here? Yeah. Like, or there's like something that's better than something else. And yes, you and I can offer our, our like, kind of like the middle split example, like work on the middle splits and you'll get your pancakes. Kind of like how I was saying, work on the one arm chin up. You'll probably get pretty close, close to the lever. Way. Yeah. <laughs> but with that said, what are you interested in? Like if you're in, if you're not interested in a one arm chin, I'm not going to program you one arm chin up work if you just want to work on lever. Like we'll just focus on the lever work. So to a certain extent, whatever you're interested in, I'm here to set you up for success. However, that may look for you. So for the lower body kind of programming, it really depends on, first of all, like a lot of people reach out to me because they want body weight training. So that may focus around body, lower body weight goals. So we're talking, you know, shrimp squat, pistol squat, dragon squat, Nordic curls, another big one. If in fact those, if you're trying to have, you know, lower body calisthenic gymnastic goals match your upper body goals. But let's say if you don't have those goals, I'm going to program, program you weightlifting. I'm going to be giving you deadlifting. I'm going to give you squatting variations, whether they're unilateral or bilateral. Um, because with the legs in general, the upper body responds really well to body weight exercises. You can get very strong without loading it externally with a bar. But in terms of the legs, the, the legs are so much stronger because they're weight bearing you all day long. It needs an external load to really get it strong. Um, not to say you can't make a lot of progress with, you know, body weight exercises, but at the end of the day, 
no one's ever going to get a double body weight back squat, not squat, not training back squats. You know, I'm not going to train shrimp squats and have that transfer that well to a back squat. Um, so if, if an athlete doesn't have specific goals, I'm going to load them up with weights. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. I think there's on average two thirds of a, a person's muscle mass is in the lower body. Yeah. So it completely makes sense. Um, so what is, so we've got some kind of like normal lower body goals. We've got some kind of upper body goals. What are some mistakes a lot of people make when they're jumping into this style of training? Uh, maybe they've come to you for advice. You just see it on Instagram or you mm -hmm. see it in general. Like someone, maybe they're coming from nothing. Maybe they're coming from uh, CrossFit or maybe they're coming from traditional weight training. And they're like, you know, I'm going to start training more one on chin variations. I'm going to start training for a freestanding handstand push up. I'm going to start training some of these lower body skills as well. What what mistakes do you see? Uh, the main one being training in that lower rep range, you know, training that one, two, three rep range all the time. It's just not, in my opinion, it's not realistic. <clears throat> it's kind of like trying to, you know, max out your deadlift every day or max out your bench press, kind of like we were talking about with the mobility. It's just not sustainable. Maybe you can work through mesocycles where you're working in a lower rep range, but if you're constantly working, you know, like let's say somebody just recently achieved their first handstand push-up, more than likely they're not going to be able to train that in a session where they can hit 15 to 20 reps. But if they think they can now, there's going to be about 50 to 60 failures on that way to try to achieving those 15 to 20 reps to achieve that training stimulus. Um, and you're just overreaching. You're doing too much too soon. Um, so the biggest mistake is training in a lower rep range because, as a default, you're choosing a variation that's too difficult for you. Even if you're capable of that higher or that more difficult variation, regress it and choose a variation that you can choose. You can hit six to eight reps, or eight to ten reps, or even sometimes twelve to fifteen reps. Okay, I like that. So let's uh. Let's talk about uh, one arm chin progression, and with that, with that in mind. So, uh, we've got a person who's like we described earlier. They've got like five really good chest to bar chins. Give us a brief overview of what sort of what would a all encompassing program just related to that look like? Like, what would what would be some progressions that you would work on there? Yeah. So honestly, like if somebody like we already talked about, we talked about the mixed grip chin ups. But my, my first goal in that is trying to not – like I'm not thinking of, okay, this person with five chin-ups, I need to get them a one-arm chin-up. This person with five chin-ups, I'm trying to get them to a one-arm chin-up asymmetric hold. So they're holding themselves over the ring or over the bar with one hand. That's where I like to start. I'm trying to solidify the starting and ending position of the movement prior to working through a range of motion. What are you cueing while they're holding that? Ooh. So a couple things. The first thing I'm thinking of is pulling the elbow behind you as much as possible so we can get like the maximal amount of scapula retraction. I'm also thinking about pushing the chest towards the ceiling, which is also going to help with that scapula retraction. Um, depending on the individual, I'm going to tell them to grip the shit out of the bar because the more we grip, the more it's going to activate those shoulder muscles. Uh, and maybe for some people too, we're going to have a little bit component of lateral flexion towards that side we're working on just to make sure we're isolating that side enough. I love that. That's, oh my God, those are fantastic cues. The grip of the bar is something like the, even the folks I work with in person who yeah. I've progressed. So I've used a lot of the strategies that you showed me for upper body strength and with guys I'm working with who are anywhere, I mean, at the youngest, like 18, 19, but at the old, and this is in person plans, that are as old as 77, 78, 80 years yeah. old, and they're working towards pull ups, and the grip the shit out of the bar is such a great cue. Like it is phenomenal. For whatever reason, I really think it helps. Uh, I don't know what it helps, but it definitely helps engage some scapula strength. And I totally get that. And that elbow behind and that chest up, man, that just sounds like it works so well. I can't wait to use that in my next session. Um, so what sort of accessory drills would you use? You've worked some one-arm chin variations. You've 
would you even program accessory drills or would you just work kind of a mixed grip chins? Yeah, so honestly, you could probably, so this is the thing too, you could probably get by with just mixed grip gyms. I'm going to be honest. Like I can maybe just prescribe eight reps by four sets, you know, rest depending on, you know, if we break it down into maybe an intensification versus accumulation <laughs> phase, you're going to have shorter or longer periods of rest. Um, but maybe that's all I did. And kind of like I was saying earlier that some people could get all the way to a one arm chin up, just training the mixed grip chin up. Um, you could probably get away with just that to be totally honest. Um, is it a well-rounded program? You know, that that's getting into the discussion. What's a, what's a good program. And we talked about this earlier, you know, the best programs, whatever works for you. Um, so if somebody's maybe short on time and still wants a one arm chin up, maybe I'd just give them that. But if they have more time and they want this quote, I'm doing a quotation thing with my hands here. Yeah, yes, I can see it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, It'll get to uh, it. I pr- appreciate that. Uh, you know, if we wanted a more well-rounded program, you know, I programmed some other stuff in there. Um, you know, we just did mixed grip chin-ups, which is a vertical pulling. I'd probably balance it out with some horizontal pulling. So that may look like some ring rows. You know, if the person wants to also work on their lever, maybe I'd give them some tuck lever work um, as kind of my secondary work. Um, so we do some tuck lever stuff. Then maybe we would finish up with some hanging scapular retractions or if they're fairly advanced, one arms, one arm hanging scapular retractions, and then maybe also some bicep curls. What are, what are your favorite? Because I think I've done a lot of, and this was so what seemed foreign and almost essentially weird to me coming from like kind of the bro bodybuilding into this sphere and been in this sphere for a few years. And it, I kind of started using it again as like bicep curls. Yeah. What is your go-to bicep? And I use them all the time and I think they definitely translate the pulling power. They really, really do. What is your go-to bicep curl? Maybe there's a couple that translates to that pulling power. Oh, this is a good one. So it really depends on, <laughs> where you're weakest in the chin up. Cause if, if, here's the day, here's the thing. At the end of the day, we can really geek out on this and get super specific. And I could be like, in kind of where I'm going to go in a second, or I could just be like, grab a barbell and do some curls. You're, you're flexing, you're extending your elbow. You're probably going to get the bicep stronger. Well, is there a, well, if I get into it, <laughs> is there a way for uh, someone who is working on the one on chin, let's say they're doing, the mixed grips and they notice they're weaker in the bottom or they're weaker in the closeout. Like yeah. is there a way for them to self diagnose and cool. then notice what sort of curl they could use to help assist in that? Yeah. So if we're going to, if we think we can be more specific there, um, and I've seen some pretty good results getting a little more specific and also at the end of the day, adding some variety in there, is also good because if we're just constantly doing the same exercises over and over again, stressing the same lines of tension, there's a chance we can end up with overuse injuries. So I also like to add variety and mix it up because of this, but let's say for example, we're weakest at the top of the one arm chin up. That's going to be way more by once we break 90 degrees where the elbow or the forearm and the upper arm are, 90 degrees so we're at the midpoint of the one arm chin up the rest of the way up is mostly going to be elbow flexion or bicep it's it's basically a bicep curl to the top so if that's the case something like ring bicep curls is a great option uh variations of preacher curls but you have to understand the ring bicep curl is so good because the shoulder joint in the elbow and i'm and i'm demonstrating as I'm doing this so I can talk it out. pointing to those (laughs) joints, I can see it. The the elbow, the shoulder joint. The shoulder is near your head. The elbow is in between (laughs) the upper arm and the lower arm. The shoulder and the elbow are in line with each other in front of, or in the ring bicep curl. So the elbow is in line with the shoulder as opposed to a, a standing dumbbell curl. The elbow is below the shoulder. So where I'm going with this is with the ring bicep curl, it's more applicable to the top half of the one arm chin up because the elbow is aligned with the shoulder. So the mechanics of where your body is, is more applicable to that. Same thing. If I was to do like 
a high preacher curl where my elbow is resting on a high bench and it's in line with the shoulder, it's more transferable to the bicep on the top half of that movement as opposed to something like a incline bicep curl where your elbow is significantly behind the plane of your shoulder. And we may have to do some posts on this to like give people visuals, but you can break it down like that and try to get more specific. And to a certain extent, that's how I try to break it down when somebody's weaker at the, the first half of the pull versus the second half of the pull of the one arm chin up, or even a chin up in general. Even a lot of my female clients that are working towards a chin up, they're getting bicep work to strengthen a certain portion of that movement. So you're touching on the bicep curls and the horizontal pulling for incredible uh, accessory drills for one arm chins, essentially just any pull up work in general. So where do you go for that handstand push up? Because I, I feel like the handstand push up has to be more complex than the one arm chin just because you're balancing freestanding. So when you're weighing not only the strength there, but also the freestanding of the handstand, like what sort of, first off, let me ask this. What is, is there a standard you have for someone just on a handstand, like a time before you even work on uh, handstand pushup work or is, are you working that without it? Like what is yeah. the, what is the, uh, what's the plan there? So for example, like kind of one of the big first milestones is getting people to do freestanding eccentric handstand pushups. So that, that's how we know we're going in the right direction, um, you know, because they can kick up, they can hold the handstand, they have, enough, they have enough strength and balance to lower themselves to the ground and not fall on their face. Uh, so that's the... Do you have them landing on some sort of pad? What is the... Uh... <laughs> so a lot of the times I'll, I'll say, hey, I want you to go to maybe, when I first have them start out, go to an elevated target. So think an ab mat, think a pillow. But I'm, I'm, I'm thinking three to four inches off the ground max. Um, and yes, it's maybe there also for a little cushion in case they fall on their face, but mainly to have a slightly elevated target just as they first go at it. So the first goal is that eccentric handstand push-up. And before I even think about programming it for them, because when I program it for someone, I'm fairly confident they're going to be able to do it, is if they have one to three chest to wall handstand push-ups consistently. So I'm talking about if I program for you every minute on the minute for 10 minutes, one chest to wall handstand push-up, you have, um, you have good control, good consistency, ownership of that chest to wall handstand push-up. So you have the strength component. The balance component would be, do you have a consistent 20 to 25 second handstand? And when I say consistent, if I was to ask you to kick up 10 times, eight out of those 10 times, you could hit 20 seconds, let's say. So now we're not wasting energy kicking up before we're even doing our eccentric. Yeah, walking around with the hands. So yeah. what, uh, on those eccentric, uh, the wall hands and push-ups, <clears throat> if you were evaluating a online client's video, what are you looking for? Let's say they can lower it, but it's, it's a quicker lower, like you obviously see, what are some sloppinesses you might see? So a couple of things I'm looking at, where do I wanna start with this? The first one I'm, I'm gonna look at is where is the elbow, and this is another good video we'll probably have to film, where is the elbow in relation to the wrist? So as someone is lowering themselves down, is the elbow in line with the wrist as they're going down, or is the elbow dropping significantly behind the wrist. Kind of like John's like demoing it to try to grasp what I'm saying. Probably not well. But... No, he's doing a pretty good job. Okay. But if the elbow is dropping too far behind the wrist, we're, we're loading our weight behind us. So now we're just kind of relying on the support of, our, of the wall and we're leaning our back into the wall to support the handstand push-up. Whereas if the elbow is, li is in line with the wrist, we're loading the shoulders or we're, we're more likely to be loading the shoulders as we lower ourselves down. So the first thing I'm, I'm looking is, are we loading the shoulders or are we just compensating by kind of pushing the weight behind us into our back? Uh, so that's the first thing I'm looking at. Next I'm looking at, actually it's still the elbows. Next I'm looking at the elbows though in a different frame of reference. I'm looking at, are they staying close to us or are they starting to chicken wing out. So chicken winging out would be more internal rotation. 
which is going to change the the use of the scapula. So if the elbows start winging out to the side in this chicken wing pattern, we start to get to, into this internal rotation, which then turns the scapulas into a, of a more retracted position. And then our chest starts to kind of puff out, which is then going to cause our spine to banana. Um, that's a lot of description. Hopefully people are able to follow that. I can totally picture it because that's something I definitely struggle with. So, um, and I can sum it up as like, if you are, have worked that drill or you maybe worked pipe pushups in the same manner, your chest seems to collapse and your elbows want yeah. to flare out and you're just, you're essentially breaking that scapular retraction. Um, is there any cue you give people or is there any? So you can think of widening. So one I like is keeping the upper back wide. Um, cause sometimes people just need to think about, Oh, I like that. I just did that and I was like, okay. <laughs> and I'm sitting in it, but I just thought about that. And that makes sense the so, way the scapulas move when you think that. Keeping the upper back wide is a good one. Um, I tell people to screw their hands into the ground or screw their hands into the parallel bars, which is going to promote that external rotation of the glenohumeral joint, which is going to lend itself to more scapula protraction in the handstand push-up. So those are two cues I like to start with, but also understanding that the scapula is going to dictate whatever the lower back does. So if we're keeping the scapula nice and protracted, that's going to kind of trickle down the back and it's going to help maintain a nice hollow body position. So any of my handstand push-ups where it looks like I have a hollow body, I'm not thinking about maintaining a hollow body at all. I'm thinking about scapula protraction and my lower back goes around for the ride. Just like if my scapula are going to pinch together and retract, that's going to, once again, trickle down my spine, and now my back is more likely to be in a banana position. So the scapula play a big role in dictating our spinal position for the handstand push-up and also for the planche or the plunge. Um, what that has in reference to what you were even asking me, I'm not really sure. I just thought it was important to this topic. Well, I love the upper back wide. Like, I think that, and I can envision that because I am someone that struggles with that Scapular contraction as I descend and as I try to press back up, and I think that's that alone is a fantastic cue. I really, really like that. I can't wait to uh, utilize that in my own training. Um, okay, so we we've, we've worked these kind of drills. We've worked eccentrics. We've worked pipe pushups. If someone has that goal of a handstand pushup, what are the ex what's the accessory work? Because I'm assuming what we just described is probably like that's what they're starting off with. They're probably warming up the wrist first. Maybe yep. they're doing some scapular pushups. And then they're jumping into it. But what are the what's the accessory work after that? So once again, it also comes down to how much time do they have to dedicate to the program? Because what we were saying, you know, you know, the pike handstand push-up work, or maybe chest to wall handstand push-ups, or or um, if they're really advanced, uh, eccentric handstand push-ups, maybe that's all they have time for. And honestly, they can probably get to handstand push-ups just with that. But if we're trying to create this in quotations again, um, a well-rounded program, I probably try to balance it out as much as I can. And I balance it out for two reasons. First of all, to maybe reduce the chance of an overuse injury, but also just to increase training morale. Um, we talked about this in the mobility episode that, you know, if somebody's in the beginning stages of a bridge, maybe you'll program some something that looks like a bridge work at the end just to make them feel like they're starting to, it's, it also has benefit, but it makes them feel like they're starting to work towards a bridge, right? <clears throat> I'll do the same work. I'll do the same thing with handstand push-up work, planche work, one arm chin-up work. You know, the main meat and potatoes is that pipe handstand push-up work, and they'll probably get there by just doing that or just doing their chest and walls or just doing their eccentrics. But <clears throat> like you've experienced it, it's frustrating. You know, you're not, you know, it's, it's a struggle. You know, you're really sitting there trying to figure out what your body's supposed to be doing. You're working all the cues. You're, you're videotaping yourself. You're reviewing it. it your, your mind's not doing what you think your body's demonstrating on the video, um, which is, it can be very discouraging, especially when you're used to coming from a gym's training setting where you go in and you're like, all right, I've got my 10 by three, you know, now I've got my five by five and you kind of check off the boxes. You feel like you're not being productive because there's more failing than succeeding, or that's what it feels like in your head. 
Um, so a lot of the times after that main handstand pushup work, you know, I may balance it out with some horizontal pushing because we've just done so much vertical pushing, but that horizontal pushing is also going to be fun. You know, I'm going to maybe give someone ring pushups, you know, weighted ring pushups. We can have a protraction focus to that, but also it just, it feels good if you can knock out 10 reps of something and you're not struggling with it because there isn't all these high levels of details you for a lack of a better it's less it's less neurologically taxing like yeah and you're getting a chest pump like you're getting like it sounds kind of bro-y but at the end of the day like you want to feel like you did a workout and sometimes with the one arm or the handstand push-up work or the one arm chin-up work you may not feel like that in the beginning of stages if you're not actually doing the reps so being able to knock out you know 10 reps of three sets of ring push-ups you kind of feel good about yourself and you maybe we're increasing morale a little but also we're working a horizontal pushing pattern. So there's some justification that it's balancing out the, the vertical pushing. You could also train some scapular protraction. So there's a long winded answer of saying, I'd probably throw in some ring pushups. I'd probably throw in maybe even some barbell military press um, just to increase raw overhead pressing strength. Maybe I'd throw in some tricep work, um, kind of similar to the bicep work. It's just maybe a weak link. It can strengthen the elbow joint on the the, the opposite side. Um, maybe some rotator cuff work too, just just because you know you can, I can make a it's this is gonna sound bad. I can make a a nice fancy sounding explanation of why I would do it, but at the end of the day too, the athlete's just gonna feel like they accomplished something, which is just as important, honestly, as it is um, to actually have that scientific explanation behind it. Yeah, I really like that. At the end of the day, I mean, I, I've done so much shoulder work, and I'm sure, obviously, Wes has as well. I have found so much value in doing human rotations, like rotator cuff yeah. work. Like, I think they translate so well to anything, and I think throwing that in on any sort of complex exercise, like a handstand push-up or one-arm chain, is, adds so much value. Like, strengthening that area of the body the rotator cuff, that external rotation trick is hugely, hugely valuable. Yeah, those those Cuban rotations are external rotation or like any sort of dumbbell external rotation accessory work. You know, one of my cues for the handstand push-ups to maintain protraction was screwing your hands into the ground. Screwing your hands into the ground is external rotation. So logic would say if we want to strengthen that pattern, maybe we should do a, a Cuban rotations. You know, I've seen just like I try to – I have this conversation with myself a lot. And yes, I have conversations with myself. Like, how do I disprove everything I think to be true? You know, and like, I'm saying like Cuban rotations are great for external rotation, which is good for handstand pushup. Just because I believe that doesn't mean it's true. And there's a lot of like people on social media that are very smart that try to oppose that view. So I really try to listen to their arguments and take it into consideration um, when I'm programming and I'm trying to go through my thought process in my head just to play both sides of it. Um, but at the end of the day, my, I see my clients benefit from it. So I like it too. I don't know where I was going with that segue either, but no, I think it's a very valuable drill. I mean, I use it with, uh, online client, online clients who just want to improve shoulder mobility to honestly, my elderly clients that I see in person, like just to develop a better moving shoulder. Like I think it's so valuable for anything. Like essentially if you can just build more strength, in a rotational capacity in the shoulder, like anything's going to be easier because from a pushing or a pulling standpoint, the shoulder is a ball and socket joint and it's rotating slightly throughout that entire movement. So if it has strength throughout that, everything's going to be easier. So And even just that pattern, being able to isolate the, that glenohumeral joint so your shoulder's not dumping forward or you're using your torso, your, like just to be able to isolate that internal external rotation for some people, for like John's elderly clients are huge. Yes. Um, uh, so let's talk lower body. So you okay. like you like barbell strength. You Love barbell like, strength. But let's go away from barbell strength. What are some lower body goals you like? So let's say you get a client because I think this happens a lot. You get a client who is. Yeah, I want to do what you do. I guess, I don't know, I want to do, like, some lower body stuff. Like, what are some, like, general lower body skill goals you give them? Like, 
I'm sure someone's that I want to be able to barbell. I want to be able to back squat. That should be intuitive. Um, they're just like, I want a lower body skill. Like what are some okay. standards for that? So like skill, or we could just call it like, think of it more as like calisthenic based lower body movements or gymnastic based lower body movements. You know, the first two I'm thinking of right off the bat are going to be shrimp squats, you know, cause that's going to kind of be the quads and then Nordic curls, which is kind of be the hamstrings. So we're, we're getting two of the heavy hitters. It's very similar to the upper body where we're doing pushing and pulling um, to kind of have a well-rounded upper body. I think if we're going to look at it from a, a body weight movement for the lower body, shrimps and Nordic curls are it for me. And then it's just determining where that person's at or determining kind of what I was saying is their 80% capacity. What can they execute 80% of the time, you know, at a relatively high rep range so we can actually train it. I like that. Yeah. So how do you, uh, how do you obviously progress? Uh, how do you regress those? So people are able to progress to them. I mean, the Nordic curl, uh, like a full unassisted Nordic curl. I know I'm so progressing to it. It's such a gnarly, gnarly thing. Like unbelievably raw strength. So that has to be tough to regress. How do you regress that? So the North, like that full Nordic curl that you're talking about is a hundred percent knee flexion extension so like all the motions happening at the knee joint um so the way i kind of regress it is i limit the motion at the knee and more of the motion to bring your face or chest to the floor is going to come from the waist so it's going to look more like a hip hinge motion versus a knee flexion extension motion um, and then the goal is over time they slowly start to open up the knee angle um, while continuing to have some sort of hip hinge motion after they built a solid base of being able to perform that, I like to give them a band and then that band regresses the movement and it takes a significant amount of body weight off of them and they can start figuring out how to keep the torso locked into place in open and close at the knee joint. For And that's for the, the Nordic curl. Yeah, you have a client that I've seen in your stories who somehow has this, I think he's totally perfected the nordic setup where he has just a like piece of two by four mounted to the wall that he uses <laughs> yeah that looks like the most <laughs> unbelievably easy you obviously know what i'm talking about yeah easy nordic setup and i'm like oh my god that's perfect it's so clever right <laughs> uh and that seems to work really really well so i think a lot of people that might be listening to this like because for some people the thought of setting up the nordic curl is like oh, i can't do that yeah. like it's Somebody literally just put like a two it's by four in the very, table. very easy. I mean, find a little, find a stud, screw a fucking two by four into <laughs> it and you're good to go. But in the gym, there's definitely a lot of techniques. I know I've used uh, the Smith machine with a bench, like put the Smith machine as low as possible, load up a fuck ton of weight and put a bench underneath it, bench, your knees are on the bench, your feet are underneath the Nordic curl or underneath the uh, Smith machine bar and you're good to go. Um, is there any other techniques you know of? Because I know you train a lot of people who work from home and that can be a difficult drill to execute. Yeah, really. It's, so the other two ones I really like wedging your feet under, you know, coffee table, a couch. I've seen, this is going to be a really hard one to explain. So if we take a normal door, like the, the door we're looking at right now at your house, and we were to take gymnastic rings and pull it under the door or not rings, a gymnastics ring strap, pull it under the door. Now somebody loops their feet through the straps, which is supported by the door. So the straps are pulling up into the door as they lean down. I probably did the most, I'm going to have to show you this after the podcast and we'll throw it on. Yeah, the I can't picture it. But... No, but it's, it's incredibly clever, and I've had two I people... I feel like I can imagine where tension from the strap could do that, though. Like, I can... Yeah. Well, that, that may be an Instagram post, yeah. but probably that's the best... That could be a nice little hack. Yeah. yeah, that's the best hack I've seen, because everyone should have a door in their house, and you should have gymnastics rings if you know you're doing this type of training. Yeah. So that's probably been one of the most clever... One of the more clever, and I didn't think about this. I've just had clients send to me kind of out of necessity. So that's probably my, my favorite one so far. I like that. Heck yeah. So, uh, we've got Nordics, we've got shrimps. I mean, shrimps are 
the, the thing about shrimp squats are they're like the never ending puzzle. Like I know I've, I've, I haven't worked in, I've worked in my own practice a little bit, but I've never like done a deep dive in them. And you, know, you can take them to such an extreme level where like you could be busy for years. Like it could be yeah. years like because you're just expanding your range. Yeah, I'm, I'm actually kind of excited with this one because so luckily you and I are pretty fortunate right now. We don't have a lot of restrictions on our lockdown, but I've got a lot of clients in Europe and other countries that are in like still pretty significant lockdowns or like gyms are closed or they don't have access. So we've taken their programs that, you know, we're doing that we were normally doing barbell, like squatting, deadlifting for the lower body, and they just don't have gym access. So we've done a heavy dose of shrimp squats, you know, for the past, you know, four, five, six months now. And I'm seeing a lot of progress in their shrimp squats, but I'm really excited to see how it, tr cause I, I'm not, once they get under the bar. yeah, once they get under the bar, did it maintain the strength, did the strength go away? Did it improve? You know, cause we can speculate and talk about like all the intricacies of it, but at the end of the day, let's see actually how it holds up. Um, so I'm, in, I'm kind of curious to see what those results are going to be out of those. I can think of four or five remote clients that, you know, have been crushing the shrimp squat game and making some good progress. So I'm curious what their back squat's going to look like. Um, kind I, mean, of, I feel like the only difference is there's not the actual spine is not loaded. So it's, so honestly, if they've done other things, I mean, I would imagine they'd be okay. You, you would think, right? Because the shrimp squat is extremely quad dominant and the more you advance it, the less mechanical advantage I believe you have. It's very similar to the planche. The, the more you advance the planche, the further, you know, or the less mechanical advantage you have, the more strength it requires to open up the hips. Um, it's the same thing with the shrimp. When you go from holding your back leg with one leg versus two legs and then to a deficit, um, it requires more isolation of that working leg. Um, kind of like the planche. Once again, I like this as an example. It's more exposure of that scapular protraction. Um, so I'm, I'm really curious because it's, it is extremely, extremely quad dominant. It requires a good deal of mobility. I can make a very sound argument on why it would transfer to the back squat, but I don't know of anybody that's really done height, like has done like a six month cycle of it. And now I've been forced to do this or they've been forced to do this out of necessity. And honestly, at the end of the day, they're enjoying the process too. So that's all that really matters. But I'll be curious to see what's their back squat look like. I mean, it seems very, uh, I'm thinking of it like you picture a shrimp squat, the knee is tracking over the toe. Yeah, it's like a knee, high bar back squat. Knee's mm -hmm. headed in that direction, depending on the level of shrimp squat you're doing. Um, it's a lot of knee flexion. It's a lot of ankle dorsal flexion. It's a lot of hip flexion. Yeah. And then you're popping back up and it's supported on one leg. So it's much more load. Yeah. And there's no the way body to... weight back, uh, or a back squat. You're really loading that up with possibly double weight body weight, which I think was one of Wes's goals. So, yeah. And there's uh, no real way to compensate when you're in a, an advanced shrimp squat, you can't really compensate. It's either you're going to use raw strength. You're going to use the quads or not, as opposed to, you know, a back squat, you know, you could consider something that's called a high threshold strategy as you're coming. Momentum. Yeah, there's you're coming, no balance. There's no balance. No, there's no balance. But like as you're coming out of the bottom of that back squat, let's say you don't have very strong quads, but you have really strong hamstrings or a strong lower back. You can have the hip shoot up first mm -hmm. and kind of good morning it, which once again, those muscles come into play and it's not wrong or right. But, you know, the shrimp squat it does as we advance it, it really doesn't give us those options. So it's kind of what we could call a self-correcting exercise, um, which also makes it kind of cool on why people enjoy it. Cool. Okay. So let's talk a little last bit here. Uh, you've mentioned these lower body skills, any accessory work you would do. You mentioned, so like some bicep variations for the upper body chin calf. Is there any calf work you think maybe? Yeah. Uh, to be allies anterior that you think would be beneficial for some of these things? So definitely for the, if we're going to keep with like the, um, the shrimp and even the Nordic curl, um, I would definitely do some sort of single leg calf raise or TA or tibialis raise. Have you ever posted any TA raises on your Instagram? I posted something recently. Yeah, I love 
anything to have anything to be off center here. I think it's a uh, under underwork muscle and yeah. I mean just the, the basic when you get the wall raising the, raising the toes. So I would, so. I, I would do those because it's also a component of ankle mobility because you're strengthening totally. both sides of the joint uh, and you need that strength, you need that control to have greater ranges of dorsiflexion. So I would definitely incorporate those for the shrimp squat. Um, in terms of the hand, the uh, the Nordic curl, we could we could do other variations of hamstring curls. Um, honestly, if you have access to a gym, there is nothing wrong with doing you know um, prone hamstring curls where you're laying on a bench like the Nautilus machine, like the Bro machine. I'll I'll program phases for clients that are working towards full Nordic curls, and we'll do hamstring curls. Um, yeah, but to answer your question, calf raises, TA raises, I think those are nice complements to the shrimp squats. Yeah, but I think at the end of the day, like, you can't do, well, correct me if I'm wrong, hamstring curls on some sort of Nordic curl apparatus and expect to get full Nordics. Am I right? Oh, so you're saying you can't... If you just were doing Nord or hamstring curls on a Nordic... Like a, a leg machine. Oh, yes. No, would definitely. You, no. If you worked up to double body weight on that, would you then like somehow, no. if I were to do Nordics, would I totally be able to get them? No, I would be, I would be shocked if that was the case. It just, it doesn't, it's one of those other things that just doesn't transfer and carry over like that. But from the flip side, if you were to work full Nordic curls and get really good at Nordic curls, I think it would transfer very nicely to that hamstring curl machine. I agree. I agree. All right, well, let's wrap it up. Uh, Wes, the the co-host, uh, <laughs> thank you for touching on the strength. We loved it, and we're excited for – this is episode four. We're except, excited for episode five. If you guys have any comments of future podcasts, we would love to hear them, any uh, possible topics, um, any reviews you want to lay. If we're able to do reviews by the time this comes out, <laughs> please leave them if not. Write it up in a Google Doc and be ready to copy and paste that at some point soon. Yeah. Um, thanks for listening from Wes and myself. <laughs>